So today I'm going to be covering a, a topic that I went over in Phoenix. So I was out in October with Chris for GPUG Summit, and this is one of the topics that I presented on while I was there. So I will be going over that with you guys in case anybody missed it and didn't get a chance to catch up on it. The other presentations that I had, I had four of them this year. So I have four different presentations out there in front of those thousands of people and had standing room in one of them and another one was close to standing room and the other two dwindled off because it was close to the end of the thing and everybody's out partying or too partied out at that point. So uh, it was good. So this was one of the ones that I did. Um, we've got a limited amount of time here, but one thing that I learned from that after feedback is I'm going to try to slow it down. So if I start to go really, really fast here, somebody just wave at me and tell me to chill out for a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at today is extending Excel with parameters. So who in here uses the Excel reports that come with GP or have looked at the refreshable Excel reports or anything like that out of, yeah, thanks, Bill. All right, so one of the things that I looked at is, okay, anytime you run those, they just run in the entirety, and then you're filtering down off of that data that comes out of them, right? Well, one of the strategies that I've worked on here recently and that I did a presentation on is, okay, let's filter that data before it comes into Excel. The benefit there is, if you've been running on GP for several years, 10 years, decade or something, and I've ran into this with a few customers, those get huge after a while, especially if you're looking at account transactions, you're over a million something records, Excel's gonna time out anyway because there's only a certain amount of records. So with the parameters, what we can do is we can add to a field, let you plug in a date or something, and that filters prior to it coming into Excel, which speeds things up, makes it easier for you as you work along. All right, so if you haven't met me, and apparently I hid my slide that actually has my introduction on it, or it's gonna be on the next one here, we'll find out. Uh, Sean Hunter, I've been with Turnkey for almost eight years in April. So it'll be eight years in April. Um, Dynamics Reporting Specialist is still my standing title at Turnkey, yet I do a lot of different things. Uh, implementation, supply chain is my area of expertise, along with the reporting side of things, SRS, Excel, and diving into Power BI now and a lot of other things out there. So, so where we're gonna get started, and I'm just gonna give you kind of a rundown of what you need to have in mind when you're getting started with parameters. So be ready to use Microsoft Query. If you've never used it in the past in Excel, we're at, that's what we're gonna be working in today. Don't be intimidated by this very old functionality of Excel. It's been around for a long time. You just may have never realized that it was actually there. Um, you'll have to have your SQL Server name handy as well. So you'll just need to know what that is. If you don't know what it is, ask nicely. That's kind of the thing that I put out there for individuals at the show was ask your IT department really nicely, buy them something pastry-wise or something like that to, to warm them up. Um, know your database name. So we've got the SQL Server and then you've got a database name. GP has that sometimes listed at the top of your windows in GP. You may see it usually whenever we set it up and implement it, some sort of abbreviation of your of your company name. Um, make sure you have security access to the data that you want to use, either a SQL user, SA user is a great candidate there if you're of that heightened security and can have access to that, or you need to have a Windows user that has access to the data as well. And I have another session that went over the security for SRS and Excel that actually goes over those topics as well. So if you don't have that access or you get in and you try anything that we learned today and it fires back and says, you can't do it with what you're trying to do. I've got another session that goes over that information. And then the last one is have your SQL query details ready. And I'm gonna cheat today, I'm gonna to go out and you've heard me throw her name around before, Victoria Uden has an awful lot of different SQL queries that we'll take advantage of today versus you being bored with me standing up here writing SQL code. I wouldn't do that to anybody. So let's go ahead and let's dive right in. So we're gonna do a demo. Now, when they put this presentation up on the web, as I assume a downloadable version of it, it has all of the steps that I'm gonna go through in the slide deck. I don't have them thrown in here because I don't love hitting the arrow 15,000 times to get through each one of them. So we're gonna go directly into a demo here. And where we're gonna get started, I'm gonna throw open Excel. So if it wasn't open already, I would have opened up Excel. And the first place I'm gonna go, I'm gonna hit my data tab at the top. And once I'm in the data tab, now keep in mind, we are using Microsoft Excel 2016 in my instance. Your experience may look a little bit different, but you essentially are gonna go the same stepping stones to get where you're at. 
And like I said, Microsoft Query has been around for a long time, so you shouldn't have any version that ditches that. As far as I know, they're not getting rid of it. So I'm going to go underneath the Data tab. I'm going to look for a button on mine that says Get Data. And then I'm going to scroll down in here to From Other Sources. And I'm going to go to From Microsoft Query. And I'm going to select that. And that's going to pull me into this window. Now this is a key part whenever we're setting these things up is every workstation that is going to access this. If you're set up in a terminal server, if you're hosted by us, or your environment's a terminal server where everybody's just RDPing in, you're probably okay with one setup. But keep in mind, every single workstation, as it is, will have to have a data source set up for it, an ODBC connection. So we're going to set that up. And this is where those key things that I was telling you come into handy, where you need to have your SQL Server name and your database name. So I'm going to choose New Data Source. And it's going to pull me in here. I'm going to name this just something very easy so I can find it every other time that I'm going to try to create something. This is a one-time create, by the way. So once I create this, no matter how many Excel reports I create after this, I can still use this data connection for my Microsoft query. So it's a one-time deal on every single workstation. The other key thing to remember, make sure this name is the same on every place you're deploying it. Because if they're accessing the exact same report, it's going to say, OK, on my computer, look for GP Excel. Do I find it? Great. Let's go from there. If it doesn't find that same name that I have named, it'll fail at that point. You'll have to set one up with the name that you originally called it. All right, so my driver, I'm going to roll all the way to the bottom of the list here, and I'm going to grab the highest level of my SQL Server native client. So that is a requirement that you'll have to have on there. You got GP installed on the workstation, chances are you have this driver. I think it's just normally out there available. But if it's not, you may have to work on getting that installed on the workstation or find an alternative place to deploy this report that you have access to. I'm going to choose that, and then I'm going to hit Connect. Connect pulls me in, and now it's looking for that SQL Server name. A lot of times you can hit the drop down there, and it's going to run out depending on how many SQL Servers you have or your network. Sometimes this takes a long time to come back with anything that you're going to find useful within it. So if you've got a place where you can, you know, somebody emailed it to you, it's a lot easier to cut and paste this at that moment. If you're like me, it doesn't come up with anything because I'm not connected to normal network area. So I'm going to come out here, and I cheated earlier, and here's my SQL Server name. So I'm going to throw that in there. I'm going to use Trusted Connection. And the benefit of using Trusted Connection versus Login ID and Password is now we're based off of Windows Security, which means that when I deploy this, Bob at Turnkey Tech runs this report. Does he have access to the data? Yes, report runs. No, it fails out. If I embed a security password in here, chances are somebody may accidentally get a hold of this report and then be able to access that data. So the Windows security configuration is the way I really like to go on these instead of embedding some sort of deep-coded SA password or administrator password to these. I'm going to use the trusted connection. I'm going to hit Options. And then underneath here, I'm going to grab my database name. Yeah, let me scrunch this up. This is... All right. So underneath there, I'm going to go to my database name. If you've ever seen Fabricam, it's always two. And then that's it. So setup is created. I've got my SQL Server name. I'm using the trusted connection. Again, depending on the report that you're deploying, you may choose to go with a different login ID or password, or you may want it to prompt them each time. This is just the most seamless way right there. And then I'm choosing my database name at that point. And I'm going to say OK. Comes back. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to hit the drop down here. And I'm literally just going to grab whatever table shows up the very first one. Completely, it doesn't even matter for what we're trying to attempt here, other than it's creating a placeholder for my next step. It just makes things easier. So I'm going to select that table. I'm not going to save my username and password in this data source because of security reasons. And I'm going to say OK. So that now creates that data source. Shows up in the list. And like I said, we use that, that point forward for any new ones that we create whenever we're using Microsoft Query. So now that GP Excel is available there, I'm going to say OK. It's going to pull me into the list here. I'm going to just grab the very first column in there. Nothing else. Again. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to 
basically set a placeholder where I'm going to be able to take that SQL query that I'm going to steal or acquire, acquire from Victoria Uden's site, and I'm going to paste that into it. So like I said, this part is just for formalities. I'm going to continue to click Next all the way through it. Nothing else matters up to this point. I want to get to the point where I get to select View Data or Edit Query in Microsoft Query out there. So we selected the column. It didn't matter what we were necessarily selecting at that point. Drilled all the way to the end of it, got to the Finish button, and made sure that I had View Data and Edit Query in Microsoft Query. I'm going to hit Finish. And that's going to pop open Microsoft Query finally. So my first thing that I'm going to do, now that it's pulled this in, is I'm going to click up here on my SQL button. So now that it's pulled open, now I can access that SQL button. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to take everything that's in this window. I'm going to delete it. And then I'm going to hop over to where it, whatever query. If somebody handed you a query that you could throw into this, go for it. If you're going to hop out to her to Victoria Uden's site, if you haven't ever been out to that site, literally go to Google, type in Victoria Uden, and you should end up at her site. And I'm going to grab one of her queries for our historical trial balance for a general ledger. I'm going to copy that from the first part of the select. In her case, all the way down just before it gives us the grant security down here for the view. Now, they could deploy this view and make it a little bit different if we needed to. I don't necessarily have to go that step, especially if getting a new view is a pain in the company. I've ran into companies before where you got to submit paperwork and you got to go through a bunch of different things to get a view deployed. So in this case, we're just going to say this is our select, top to bottom, copy that, go back to my Microsoft query, and I'm going to paste that in there. Now the one thing I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to take out the where clause on this just for this moment because we want to add that in as our parameter in just a moment. So I pasted the SQL query in there. I click OK. It's going to say, hey, by the way, this can't be represented graphically. You want to continue? I'm going to say OK to that. It's just basically saying, hey, Microsoft Query cannot handle your current configuration for that. So that pulls in. And then I'm going to click up here to return data. All right, so we pasted the query in there. In my case, I just removed the where clause because we're not going to add that in until the end. And then I hit return data. Pulls me back into GP. If you've ever been to any of them or if you've done any type of the data connections before, you may have seen this window. If not, all it's asking is, hey, do you with this data, do you just want to throw exactly what it returns in? Do you just want to go straight to a pivot table? What may it be? I 99 times out of 100 go with a table because that gives me all of my raw data on one sheet that I can look at. I could hide the sheet if I wanted to, but at least it's there if I need to drill into that information. So I'm going to select table, say OK, grabs all those data from that, uh, from that query and pulls it back into my report here. Now what I'm going to do, now that the data is imported, I'm going to go back to my data tab at the top. I'm going to go to properties for it. If I'm not clicked somewhere within that table that I just brought in, my properties won't show up. I can always go to queries and connections or connection details on older versions and things like that. But if I'm clicked in there, it should bring up the option for properties. So I'm going to click on properties. I'm going to go into the window here. And then I'm going to click on the little icon here to the right that's connection properties, which should bring up our connection properties window. And then if I go to my definition, Here's the SQL query that I pasted back in Microsoft Query in its entirety. Now, if I scroll all the way to the bottom, there should be that spot where I took out the where clause, the, the part where it's basically saying, OK, return all of the data where x equals y, right? So at the end of the query, I'm going to put that into there. Now, depending on what you're bringing in, it's pretty simple to write these things in as well. So easiest rule of thumb that I can give you for any parameters that you want to add from any SQL query that somebody gave you. So if you go out to her site and you get something that's all details and you want to add a parameter to it, pay attention to the column names that are in here. And you can use those for the formula as well. 
So it's real. It's pretty simple to put these in. We would do where account type equals whatever we want it to be. We wanted that to be a parameter. We could do it. And where G year one equals year. And that's this field right here. And it has to be the unfriendly name in this case that we did. If you're using sales transactions or one of the views, a lot of times they are, these are friendly. We'll go back and we'll take a look at using one of the, the SQL views that's out there for smart lists here in just a second to make something that's a little nicer for this too. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom here. And in order to get this to activate as a parameter, I can select this. And all I'm going to do is put a question mark. So where year one equals question mark. That is the Excel code to trigger a parameter. So after I hit OK here, it should pop up and ask me what is my parameter. Okay? So I'm going to type in and I'm just going to say, okay, you know what, 2027, because we're, you know, in the Fabricam future here selling outdated computer equipment. So I'm going to say okay there. And say okay. And it should run out and rerun that data based off of that information. Now I'm going to have to look at her query because it's not doing exactly what I'd like it to, but we'll find out. But the most important thing to do at this point is, okay, well now we've got a parameter in there, but let's make it where a field activates that. So I'm going to insert a row above this, and I'm going to type in just some sort of name for this, year question mark, and then I'm going to go back to my connections and queries or properties, go back to my connection properties, back into the definition, and you'll notice if, it, if you didn't notice it before, this was grayed out, but now that there's a parameter, I can click on this. And that's going to pull open that window again where we designated what the parameter was. And one of the options within here is get the value from the following cell. So if I select this radio button and then say, okay, the cell that I want this to be is here. And then refresh automatically when cell value changes. So now I'm saying, okay, anytime I go in and I change this cell value, it's going to go select XYZ from table, return data based off of the value that you've thrown in there, and rerun that data. So now, like a form, like a report, like a GP report with parameters, we're doing the same thing with the GP cell out there. So I'm going to say OK to this. And the only other thing, if you didn't see me check it, I said refresh automatically when cell value changes. That just means I don't have to hit the refresh button. As soon as I change that value and it says, okay, he changed it from 27 to 26 or whatever, it goes and reruns the data with that parameter filled into it. So I'm going to say okay. Run back to the window here. And now if I come up here and I put in something, it reruns. And frankly, I don't know what the original value was for this. I'm going to have to look at her query that she's using to see exactly what it does. But every time I make a change to this, there's a little blip down here that says waiting for query to be executed, and it runs that through. Let's get a better example here that doesn't break. So to reiterate, to walk back through the steps, now that I've created my data source, if I want to throw something else into this, they go out, once again, get data from other sources, from Microsoft Query. It already exists, so I don't have to create a new one at this point, which means that I don't have to remember my SQL Server name and the database name. It's already saved out here for me to use. Say OK. Pulls me in again. We're just creating that placeholder. I'm grabbing the very top column of that so I can zoom to the very end and view data. Let's go out and let's just see what else she has to offer in her tables. And let's just grab, let's just grab a big one here, all GL transactions. Why not? Now I'm going to simply grab all GL transactions at this point, which is a pretty hefty one in most cases. Copy that. Go back to SQL here again. 
So we're in the Microsoft query. I've got my query ready to go. I'm going to go to SQL on this. I'm going to erase just the placeholder that we had for it. And I'm going to paste my SQL query in there. If you've got SmartList Builder, some of the windows, some of the, uh, the table finder will give you the select star from the table that it comes from too. So there's a lot of different resources out there. You're more than welcome to scour the web for different views and different SQL scripts. You can always hit us on support if you need some help with something. I'm more than happy to help guide you through whatever you need, finding table-wise or identify something. It usually only takes a moment to do. So it squawks at me, again, telling me that the SQL query can't be represented graphically. I'll continue, but here's all my data being returned at this point. So I'm going to go up, and I'm going to return that data. I'm going to throw it to a table. And now that it's thrown into my table, I'm going to go back to my data tab, back to properties, Back to my connection properties, go to my definition, and I'm going to roll to the bottom of this. This one's probably one of the easier ones where you would want to have a view created for it because it is kind of a conglomeration of a bunch of stuff. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of step through here. Sometimes you may find it easier to work in something other than that little tiny window that they have. So a lot of times I'll take the query that was out there and I'll throw it out to a notepad or Word or something along those lines to, to work with this. But I'm just going to zoom to the bottom of this, and I'm going to add my where statement. Okay, so where, and let's find our column. So scroll back to the top, and let's just do the transaction date for now, just to make it simple. So we'll grab the transaction date, and I'll say, okay, GL transaction date. I'm going to copy that field exactly like it is, minus the friendly name there, but just the field. I'm going to scroll to the bottom. I'm going to paste that down here. And then between question mark and question mark. You could do an and. You can do an or. There's all sorts of composition. If you're friendly with Excel and you're used to building formulas in Excel, you know, the parentheses all come into play too. So you can do structured formulas as you're working with it. Or it can be just as simple as that thing, between here and there, please. So I'm going to say the date is between here and here. Like I said, this is a little bit more visually appealing. I'm going to copy that entire thing. I'm going to go back to my window here, select that all, and paste it. So now I've got my parameter down there, question marks. And I say, OK. So now it's coming up, and it's asking me for parameter 1. Now this is the one thing that I haven't overcome yet, and it's on my list of things to do. I haven't found a way to rename these things just yet. Once I figure that out, I'll post something about it and let you guys know. But I haven't found a way to rename the parameter so it doesn't just come up as parameter 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. So keep track of the sequence that you put these things in. It will go in the logical sequence as it goes through these. So keep in mind that as you go through and it's parameter 1, parameter 2, parameter 3, it's basically working its way down logically of what you filled in in the query out there. All right, so for the first one, let's do, I don't know, 4... 1, 2027. And I'm going to say OK. And then for the next one, I'm going to do 4, 31, 2007, uh, I'm going to say OK. And it's a bad parameter type. OK, so what did we do wrong? Maybe we need to do something else. Hey, that's a great one. There's not a 31st day in April if anybody in here was questioning that. It's nice that it actually told you that, though, for me. All right, so I throw that in, and now my data is filtered down to just that period in time. So from there, to make this where now I can fill in a cell for these, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to insert, and I'm going to say transaction date. Add another one in here. From just like we're kind of used to in GP, right? So I'm going to throw those up at the top. And then I'm going to go back to my property. Again, if you don't see that right away, you notice whenever I'm not clicked within the table that I added in, properties is not lit up. It's just much easier to make sure I'm in that table so I don't get to the wrong one. I go back into the connection property, go back to my definition. I'm going to click on parameters. Again, remember, if you've got 20 different parameters in here, keeping track of the sequence that you went through, 
as you're looking at these. All right, so then I'm going to drop down, and then it's going to say, get the value from the following cell. I'm going to come up here to the top, and I'm going to say this one. So click here, click up there, fills in the cell, refresh automatically when the value changes. Okay? Go to parameter number two, do the same thing. And we say okay, and we go back. Now, in theory, when I fill this in and say, okay, I want to look at the first of March, then it should refresh. Now that error message that came up is just because I didn't have a two on there yet. It was looking and saying, hey, blank date doesn't, that doesn't logically set. So you may throw dates in there before you go in and tell it which cell you want to use, but that's it. So now our data, again, is refreshing based off of those values. You don't have to go in and change your query. You don't have to manage that over time. This goes out and it should run relatively quick and means that we don't have to put some sort of dynamic filter to only show open data and things like that. This should churn through a lot quicker. So now we've got that capability to create Excel reports, forms, whatever it may be, that are a lot more dynamic, allowing you to fill out data as you go. Deploy this for a user and they can start creating those things. Now that parameters are built into it, keep in mind that you could throw a pivot table onto this, and as you change your values there, then your pivot table is changing as well and filtering that data out. So let me pause for a second. We've gone through two times. Again, nobody waved at me and said, slow down. Question on the functionality here that we've kind of ran through. See some significance here, hopefully, and benefit that it could offer at least. So again, this is the inspiration for this was a company that I was working with and they needed some financial pivot tables and things like that built off of their account transactions. They went in the first time to use the Excel ones that are out with GP. Well, those just go out and say, return everything. And it just died on them because they had 10 plus years of financial data and millions upon millions of records. So we were able to use this functionality here to whittle that down beforehand and allow them to drive those dashboards a little bit more dynamically thereafter. In their case, we actually took those parameters and we threw them onto a completely separate sheet. Hid the, the table behind it, they would fill in the parameters, the data table would run, they'd refresh, and all of a sudden all the pivot tables are reflecting the filtered down data set. So a lot of different attributes there that can work with uh, work with these parameters. This also is nice because it opens the door for other functions as well. And one of those is using stored procedures. That's something that I go into great detail in the, uh, the slideshow as well. So that'll be a secondary part on this that goes through using stored procedures um, in the file that's out there from GPUG and such. I think we may have it deployed or at least I threw it out on GPUG. If anybody's members of the GPUG site, I threw a file out there for historical receive not invoice. So if anybody's on GP 2016 or later, there is now a received uh, invoice historical document, and it runs off of this as well. So there's a lot of different options out there. Um, I Now that I've got this functionality, I've started to dive into surfacing other stored procedures from GP that your reports and SRS reports are based upon and throwing them into this. One of those was the historical stock status report. So now that's getting thrown into this, or the HITB report. So those are all capabilities of this to be developed never hesitate now to say, is it possible? Because I can get in and usually identify this stored procedure that it's based upon and maybe get you an Excel-friendly version of it out versus the wonderful GP ones we're all used to. So questions, comments, uh, drill into something else that you may have missed, challenge me. Sean, you said you're going to send us this information. This, as far as I understand, will be posted in its PDF form, which has all of my hidden secrets of the PowerPoint behind it. If you notice, my PowerPoint has numerous slides there hidden behind the scenes. That's just so it didn't clutter up my presentation as I went through and had to try to drill through it. And each one of these goes through step-by-step, screenshot-wise, of what I did just a moment ago. And like I said, this presentation also includes the second part of it for using stored procedures as well. So if you're getting adventurous and you want to dive into stored procedures, those are available as well. 
All right, so what's next? No oh, man, all right. So what's next whenever we get, get done with this? And the thing you have to remember as you, as you wrap this up and you've deployed this report out for individuals, next thing is, again, the ODBC must be identical on everybody's machine. So make sure that that same name is used on each one whenever you set it up. Same exact configuration. Don't deviate from that at all. Uh, find a shared location to save the spreadsheet or save to the location of your other GP reports are saved. Remember, there's a repository of Excel reports that are saved out there. If you save to that, it shows up under the menu options in GP. You've never seen that before. If you go into sales or purchasing or inventory, there's an option on the left-hand side that says Excel reports. And that is pointing to a repository that is our GP 2016 share on whatever server, right? If you put them to that exact same location that those are, it then shows up in that same menu. So just kind of keep that in mind. You can make it easy. Or again, if you've got a shared location for it, make a backup of the original somewhere safe. Learned that one the hard way where we threw the file out and I said, go take a look at this. And they got in and they looked and then they did something and it broke and it was a bad experience. So I always save a backup of it. They save a backup of it. If it's important, just make sure you have a repository of company backups that are the originals. Um, next part is configuring security. Like I said, download the GP, uh, GPUG slide deck that I have out there. Um, that has both for the Excel and FSRS. If you run into any snags, don't hesitate to throw me an email. Be more than happy to answer any questions where you get stuck on things. This is the websites for them. Again, that'll be available in the slide deck. I just went ahead and threw them in there because why not? Those are each one of the ones that I did while I was out there. So you'll get to see them in their entirety for what everybody got to see while I was in Phoenix. Beautiful area. And of course, happy holidays. So hope everybody has a wonderful holiday season.